This is Jim Bell. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, recorded webinar uh, today. Uh, our topic is Retirement Spending, a Blueprint for Smart and Strategic Distributions. I want to introduce our, our panel right now. Uh, first is Bob Haywood. Uh, Bob is a, an attorney here in Oakland, and he has the distinction of being the uh, first client to join our organization back in January of 1991. Uh, Next, Forrest Bell is our Senior Investment Advisor and Certified Financial Planner. Uh, Forrest uh, manages our Financial Planning Department uh, along with others like finance and so forth. He's, uh, he joined us in 2005. And uh, Jereen Meisert is our Senior Relationship Manager. Uh, Jereen joined Bell Investment Advisors in, uh, in 2008. So let's uh, go ahead and begin. Uh, Forrest, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Jim. As you can see from the overview slide, this presentation is really going to focus on the logistics of retirement funding. Where does the money come from? How do you get your money? We'll talk a little bit about required minimum distributions and taxes and then end with some comments about portfolio allocation and, and then keeping your plan on track. Uh, the logistics of retirement funding are really important because they allow solid retirement plans to stay on track. Um, in a minute, we'll go over some case studies, but before doing so, I want to give the floor to you, Bob. You're the inspiration for this presentation. You have a lot of experience with the logistics of retirement funding, and I want to give you the chance to talk about why it's been so important to you. Thanks, Forrest, Jim, and Jerine. Well, I thought how I'm handling retirement income with the assistance of Bell Investment Advisors might be helpful to others. When I turn on the radio or television every morning to see how the market's doing, I inevitably hear ads about saving for a good retirement and how the company doing the advertising will make that happen. And I think we all understand the concept and necessity of saving for retirement, but nobody seems to be talking about what you're supposed to do when you're ready to take the money out and how you go about planning for that. And that's what we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> I should say as an introductory matter that I'm here strictly as a satisfied long-term client of Bell. I'm receiving no compensation for participating in this program, though I'm happy to do this, especially because of Jim and Bonnie Bell's sustained and generous contribution to East Bay philanthropic organizations, especially in the arts and for youth music education. I worked at a law firm where we were required to put funds into a retirement account. When I started putting away money for retirement 30 years ago, I knew the day would come when I wanted to get the money. And that day is here. My pension plan, like most, is one where all the distributions are taxable because the money that went in was tax deferred. I wanted to get the money out and make that happen in an easy to understand and convenient way coordinating distributions and tax uh, payments with consideration to my overall financial condition. Now, my personal situation, I think, is pretty typical of many who are in my generation. We're gradually moving from full employment to part-time work to eventual full retirement, taking funds along the way to supplement earnings. I suppose there's some who do the what was more characteristic of the past, where one day they're working and one day they're retired, but more and more people are following the model that I am doing. So I need to coordinate retirement distributions with earnings, other in income such as dividends and interest, and starting in 2019, hopefully Social Security. So the plan is that working together with Bell and his staff will best ensure the money will last not only for my life, but for that of my wife's if she uh, outlives me. <clears throat> so how I work with the Bell staff to plan for distributions and how we coordinate them according to my financial conditions and needs. I have a semi-annual meeting with key Bell personnel for overview of the upcoming next six months and beyond. First, we do an assessment in terms of my needs and where we're comfortable in terms of asset allocation of all the money in the account to find the best blend of capital preservation and asset appreciation, factoring in risk considerations. 
Then we decide on what will be a prudent amount to take out on a monthly basis. I used a fixed dollar amount rather than a percentage of assets approach. And then we divide that amount between me, federal withholding, and state withholding. I know others follow a model where they take out a percentage of the holdings, oftentimes 4% figure is used, or they take out money based on life expectancy models. What I personally like best is that I use Bell to take care of paying taxes on my pension with distributions and coordinating withholding to avoid the inconvenience of paying tax, both on the money they're distributing and on funds I get from other sources that don't have withholding, such as dividends, interest, and if I have capital gains on stock sales. I do want to make it clear that Bell employees are not the ones telling me how much money I owe for taxes or need to pay. I go to my tax advisor for this and I use Bell to make sure that the tax get paid so I don't have to worry about sending in quarterly estimated tax payments. I understand that some of people watching this may be coordinating those taxes uh, with their brokerage account folks and whatever works for you is fine but Bell will give you the opportunity to coordinate this in a manner that works best for you. So, the logistics of how this works is that working as a team, we figure out where I want the money to go. A check to me, or perhaps putting some money in a brokerage savings or checking account. And then this is done by direct deposit. Bell makes that happen in a way we'll be looking at as we study some case studies in just a few minutes. But what I really like the best is that this is all done for me. So you want to figure out whether you want to take out a set percentage of assets each year or whether it's best to focus on a dollar figure. As I said, I like knowing that I'll be getting a direct deposit for a fixed amount each month with all taxes withheld. And if we planned it right, that withholding takes care of taxes I'm likely to owe on other earnings in accounts not managed by Bell. So I also like the flexibility of having access to the Bell staff, not only at these six month meetings, but over the course of the year. For example, as an example of flexibility, I sold stocks with gains from my brokerage account, which was not managed by Bell, from which no withholding was taken. So I adjusted my monthly Bell payout, so more went to taxes, so as to avoid a nasty surprise next April. When I needed some money to help close the gap on a down payment for a vacation home, we accelerated this year's monthly payments, again coordinating how much would be going to state and federal taxes. So again, hopefully I won't find myself in trouble come April 2018. So how do I work with my relationship manager, my relations manager, I should say, Jereen Meiser, who is who you're going to be hearing from in just a moment. We check in regularly to tweak withholding tax percentages, timing of distributions, and special needs. For example, you might need extra funds for an unexpected situation, which might be an investment opportunity, taxes, money to help a child, wedding, medical needs, or anything else. As mentioned this year, I had to take out more money and have more withheld from monthly payments to take care of capital gains on money I used for that vacation home. But you made that happen. So this has worked well for me, and when I get Social Security in 2019, I know we'll make substantial changes in how my retirement funds are allocated. And we'll be talking about an example of that as we proceed this afternoon. So now I'll turn this back over to Forrest and Jereen to look at some case studies applying the concepts that we've been talking about. Thank you, Bob. This is our first case study and it, it uh, relates to a married couple age 62. You'll notice they're semi-retired, so still working, not yet receiving Social Security. They do need portfolio assets to supplement their part-time work. Fortunately, they have a brokerage account and an IRA account. Um, and their need is $10,000 per month in total income. One of the important things in this phase is part-time work. What we hope for all of our clients is that they can create what we would call an elastic career. What we mean by an elastic career is that around this time, clients begin focusing on making their work uh, invigorating, engaging, um, part of their quality of life, 
if it's possible to adjust your role or responsibility so that you do more of what you really love to do, uh, that's wonderful and important because it can extend your career during this phase. Some people discount how valuable part-time work is, but what's important to bear in mind is every dollar you earn in this phase is a dollar you're not taking out of your portfolio. And that has a cumulative powerful effect to make sure that your money uh, doesn't run out by the end of your plan. Uh, if you look now at some of the resources that we use during this phase, uh, you'll notice a number of them. Uh, Social Security and pension, we've grayed out here because while there are some important exceptions to delaying these benefits, we mostly advocate that people wait to take their Social Security and pension because of how the benefits accumulate over time. What that means for this particular couple in this phase of their retirement is that they have to rely on their IRA accounts and their brokerage accounts to make up their needs. You'll notice part-time income at the bottom there is really helping, but it's providing $2,500 a month, not the full $10,000 that they need. So we're going to rely on their IRA accounts and their brokerage accounts to make up the difference. Some may be surprised to see that we recommend distributions from the retirement account at this age. You certainly don't have to at age 62. You're not mandated to take uh, IRA distributions until age 70, which Doreen will get to later in the presentation. But the reason that we recommend this uh, currently is if you look at the part-time work, it still leaves a lot of room in a low tax bracket, in this case, the 15% tax bracket. So by drawing money out of the IRA accounts, we take full advantage of all of the uh, money available to um, pass through that 15% tax bracket, which is really efficient when you think about the uh, tax brackets that you were able to avoid in your peak earning years when you were contributing to these accounts. So we take advantage of, of the entire 15% federal tax bracket and then we make up the difference with the brokerage account that leaves us settled with the $10,000 a month that this client needs. In the second case study, it's the same couple, but now we're farther along in their financial plan. At this stage, they are fully retired. So they're, they're not earning money uh, at this point. Um, they still have their brokerage account and IRA accounts and their need remained the same at $10,000 per month. Now the configuration of where the income comes from has changed. You'll notice that Social Security and pension uh, play an important role. They form the foundation of where the income is coming from, replacing what was part-time income. Uh, Social Security is uh, providing a robust benefit as is pension or, or other income. Still, there, to meet the need of $10,000 per month, we need to use the IRA account and the brokerage account. In this case, we'd actually like to be taking a little bit less out of the retirement accounts, but as, as Jareen will talk about momentarily, you are mandated at age 70 to uh, take required minimum distributions from these accounts. So we just fulfill the required uh, mandated amount and then we rely on the brokerage account to make up the difference to make sure again uh, for now and for the future this ten thousand dollar per month need can be met I want to make one other comment about the pension category many people don't have pensions and so I have listed other income there since most of our clients live locally and in California what they find is they have a lot of equity built up in their primary residence. Just by being a homeowner in this area, you'll find that a lot of your net worth belongs in real estate. And that presents certain opportunities, uh, the most common of which is downsizing. But downsizing is not the only way to take advantage of the value of your primary residence to help with retirement. What some couples do is they'll build a cottage in their backyard and rent that out or build the cottage and move into it, renting out their larger primary home. Uh, sometimes they'll move out of their primary home into a smaller place and rent their residence because it's much bigger than what they need at this phase of life, or even create an in-law uh, with a certain part of the house or, or even converting a garage. 
there are many ways to go about this and it's an important consideration for California homeowners who have a lot of opportunities uh, in, in this domain. With that, I want to move on to Jereen, who is going to talk more about the mechanics of how this money from these different sources, particularly the IRA and trust accounts, gets to our clients. Thank you, Forrest. Um, my job comes in in this scenario. Uh, once the client has decided which account or accounts they'll be taking their distributions from, and we think of it as uh, a paycheck. So you maybe you're getting uh, money from a part-time job, but now your brokerage and or IRA account is going to um, serve as uh, a source to send you a paycheck. And that paycheck can come to you however it works for you. It can be on um, uh, via a check. It could be a wire. Those, those um, ways are not as convenient as what most of our clients use, which is setting up an electronic connection to the account they use most uh, to pay their bills. And we'll set up those links to a checking or a savings account. So your Schwab account sends out what amount you need on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. Uh, however, it flows best to work with your financial uh, plan and your the way you pay your bills and um, schedule your life to work financially. We try to keep a certain amount of cash in your accounts that are funding these distributions. We don't want to keep too much. We want to make sure your money's working as hard as it can for you. So we try to coordinate it with our monthly trading when we do our investment committee meetings. If we're going to be selling something that is um, lagging in performance and we know you need cash on a monthly or quarterly basis, we'll hold back cash from that trade to make sure that we're using that money um, to, to fund your life and then let the rest of your money fund your future. If we're making trades in your taxable or non-retirement account, the brokerage account we were talking about, um, we're going to be also considering taxes and trying to be as tax efficient as possible. If there are funds that have uh, short, uh, low, low uh, unrealized gains in the account or maybe um, some losses, we'll look to pick on those funds to sell because what we'd like to do is keep your realized gains as low as possible and if we can find some losses here and there, we'll harvest those because the losses can be used in your current um, tax year to offset any gains and if you have more losses than gains in a tax year, you can actually carry them forward and use them to offset gains in future tax years. Jereen, before you go on, I should also point out that management fees that are paid from these retirement accounts, um, the IRA type of retirement account, are not considered a taxable distribution for purposes of your tax planning. That is true. That is true. Um, I, I also want to just mention um, uh, in how do I get the money and, and uh, link back to something Bob said. If you're taking money from a retirement account, we're going to ask you to make a decision about tax withholding. You can choose to have no withholding at a state or a federal level, but you can choose to have percentage withholdings, not dollar amounts, but percentage starting at as low as 10% for federal and 1% for California. So when you choose withholding, we'll be withdrawing a gross amount uh, from your account that includes the withholding. Schwab helps us work with you. We peel off the federal withholding and send it to the appropriate state. We peel our the um, appropriate entity. We peel off state withholding, send that to the appropriate state, and the net is what goes to you into your account. At the end of the year, you're going to get a statement from Schwab that they'll also provide to the taxing authorities that will show the total amount you withdrew, all of that which will be taxable, and then what your withholding has been so you can put that on your tax forms. 
I'd also like to remind anybody watching this that you use Schwab as a custodian for the funds. Your investments are not in Schwab stock or anything like that. You, you use them to make sure that uh, the money is in a safe place. And also should point out that you don't have the ability to get to the money yourself. So there's no danger that somebody's going to run off with the money. Nope. Stays right in your account, Bob, unless we send it to you or the, the state or the federal. So those withdrawals are pretty much at your discretion from your retirement accounts up until you reach age 70 and a half. Once you hit that magical number, uh, the government the IRS now wants you to start taking money at a certain level. It's a requirement. So if your birthday, if you turn 70 um, between January 1st and June 30th of any year, of a year, um, that year is your year in which you reach age 70 and a half. And the IRS gives you a formula for calculating how much you have to take out. It's based on your life expectancy and it starts out at maybe 3.9% um, a little under 4%. You're going to need to take that money out whether you like it or not and the government makes it really helpful for you to remember that by penalizing you heavily if you don't do it. The penalty is 50% um, uh, excise tax on any amount you should have taken that you didn't take. So uh, it's something clients need to take seriously. We take it very seriously and um, that's a, a very uh, pointed event in our office and the last month of the year we're very, very focused on making sure all of our clients who have a required distribution have taken them. And the, the distributions apply to traditional and rollover IRAs, to uh, SEP IRAs, Simplified uh, Employer Plans, 401ks, though there are some exceptions, and other kinds of retirement accounts. If you have uh, more than one traditional or rollover IRA account, you do have the ability to um, add together the total uh, required distribution and actually withdraw from one account rather than parsing out to each individual account. And we help a lot of clients do that. There's also um, a nice option that uh, comes when you turn 70 and a half and that is uh, the ability to use your IRA distribution to fund um, charities of your choice. To, to be able to do that you have to be over 70 and a half and you have to have the payment made directly to the charity. And when you do that, the, the money goes to the charity. It's recognized as having been distributed from your account. So it's uh, taking care of your required distribution. But you're not going to be deducting it from your taxes as you would in maybe other years when you wrote out checks uh, to a charity. And um, we, we work with a lot of clients that do that. There are clients who actually don't need all the money that they have in their IRA account, but because they're bound to take the money uh, or suffer a penalty, this gives them a great way to serve, serve charities that they hold dear uh, as well as take care of the requirement. But that's not a taxable distribution, is it? Uh, it is not a taxable distribution in that it does not increase their taxable income, but if the check goes to the charity directly, it satisfies their required distribution up to the amount of the check. Thank you. So for um, all of our clients, whether they're taking money from a retirement account or a non-retirement account, we offer the option of coordinating with their uh, tax professional to make sure that we are all in sync with uh, what kinds of distributions they're taking, or what kind of withholding is happening, 
as Bob says, we um, do a, a, a little triad with clients and their accountants to make sure that if there is uh, changes to withholding, that we're mm -hmm. doing it and keeping it in sync with what's working financially for the client and in the whole picture of their, of their life. Uh, one of the things that we will do upon request is we'll provide quarterly reports to clients and their accountants which report realized capital gains, capital gains distributions, and income. These are important for the non-retirement accounts because these kinds of activities are going to be impactful when you're filing your taxes. So it's good to know what's coming up uh, so you have an option to either increase your withholding on your uh, retirement accounts like Bob does or to uh, give you kind of a heads up so you know to maybe do a little more estimated taxes as the year is winding to a close. So this is just a picture of a portion of the IRA distribution form just to give you an idea. So the first time our clients are taking a retirement account distribution, you are asked to choose withholding. And as you can see from this, you can very um, easily choose I don't want federal income withheld or you can choose a percentage. 10%, as I said, is the lowest, but you can use any whole percent above that. And once this is um, chosen at the federal and the state level, it's not, it's not set in stone. It can change. It can go up and down. It can even go down to zero if, if that works for you. And this last slide um, pertains to our um, non-retirement accounts. This is an example of what we would be looking at as we're preparing to raise cash in a non-retirement account. We're looking to see what is being held in the account and what we're looking for in many cases is to try to find a little place to harvest a loss for the client, raise the cash, but also find a um, tax loss for them that will offset any other gains that have occurred throughout the year. And now I'm going to send it back to Forrest, who will pick up from here. Thank you, Doreen. So two items that we want to give special focus to in the semi-retirement phase are establishing an emergency cash reserve and reassessing a client's risk tolerance. Emergency cash reserves are important for all points in time during your financial cycle, life cycle, but of particular importance as you near retirement. Emergency cash reserves are an amount of cash that you leave aside for unanticipated expenses. Try as you might, you cannot predict everything that happens in your life. Uh, oftentimes there are surprise medical bills or dental procedures. You might need to replace a roof or a foundation, or a plumbing issue, or a car, uh, or provide some help to a family member that you just didn't foresee. And this is an amount of cash that is um, functions as a buffer for those unexpected needs that we really like to see in place uh, by the time of full retirement. The other thing we bring special attention to during that phase is reassessing risk tolerance. Uh, many clients who demonstrate incredible intestinal fortitude for volatility in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s change a little bit as they near retirement and for important reasons. So we want to pay special attention to that to make sure that whatever amount of risk we're taking within the portfolio is something that the client can live with. The secret to any kind of investment strategy is an underlying discipline and that means respecting the investor's philosophy and risk tolerance. So we bring special attention to both those conversations. Some other helpful practices for keeping a strong retirement plan on track, in addition to all the things that we've talked about uh, relating to funding retirement and the logistics, is to discover your actual spending pattern. So what we know is that looking at current living expenses is a serviceable baseline for how clients will like to live in retirement 
if they feel like they're living a good life now. But there is some variance. Some couples go on to spend more modestly in the retirement phase than they predicted. And in those circumstances, it just creates more capacity for other things that they might care about. Alternatively, some people end up spending more, which requires us to make other adjustments within the overall plan. After the settling period occurs, which is about two years for clients in retirement to really understand and get comfortable with what their spending needs might be, we find that the goals multiply. People get comfortable with how this process works, um, and if they have a strong plan and they're following all the best practices, they start asking questions like, would it be possible for me to fund a 529 plan for my grandchild? Or is there a way that I can help my children uh, pay off some of their student loans uh, or even afford a down payment for a home in this area? Uh, all of those things feed back to the financial plan and we analyze and look at to figure out ways that we can support these growing ambitions as they happen. Finally, analyzing shifts in housing preferences. I mentioned how many of our clients are looking at their homes and thinking of them in terms of how they can support retirement goals. But even those who aren't interested in making any changes to their living arrangements do start thinking about the final phase of their plan. Uh, is, is their home level entry, for example? Is it the place that they wanna be for the rest of their lives? And oftentimes the preferences there shift in important ways and we need to help our clients move through that analysis and make really prudent, strong choices for them uh, as they consider a change of some, of some kind. And then finally, adopting to unforeseen events. Some unforeseen events are very positive. Uh, sometimes our clients receive unexpected inheritance, in which case they have additional financial capacity that affords them the ability to spend in ways that maybe they, they didn't think they could before. Other times the unforeseen events um, uh, are, are less welcome. There might be a family member that falls ill, a, a, a mother or a father or a spouse, in which case we have to go back and make some adjustments and redesign the plan to make sure it works and provides the best quality of life possible. Those are some of the practices in addition to everything discussed that we like to uh, attend to in these different phases of retirement. Um, Bob, I want to thank you again for being the inspiration for this, this presentation and being with us today. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear about them. These are various ways that you can be in touch with us or send a question our way, which we'd love to help you with. And uh, thank you again for your attention and time. We always appreciate it.